All right. Welcome. How are you, Heather? I'm good. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Lonnie, how are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How good are morning. you? I'm good. I'm good. All right. Let's dive in. As always, um, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions, or I do have the chat window open, so I do try to keep an eye on that, but it could be a delayed response. Um, so if you have questions, just unmute yourself and say, wait, I've got a question, um, and we will jump in. I also, just so everyone's aware, I've had a couple of videos flagged lately, so they've gotten pulled, so we're figuring out a workaround around that, because like the one where I was showing you how to attach smart plans, well, they're not smart plans, drip campaigns to your contacts. Um, it said that there was personal information that was divulged. I don't know what personal information was divulged, but so anyways, they pulled that video and they pulled one other one too. So we're trying to get those fixed and back on. So um, if you watch the, if you, <laughs> so number one, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you'll get them as they come on. However, there's a couple that we may have to move to private. So if you're missing a couple of sessions, something that you're trying to make up on, um, there's that spreadsheet that is posted. Um, I think that Abby and Carly have sent it out a couple times on like the Foxhole group that you can go to that has links, hyperlinks to all the videos. So some of them we're moving to the ones that get flagged. We're trying to repost them and put them as private instead of public in the hopes that we can keep them on there because we've noticed that seems to make a difference. So just a heads up on that. Um, and we don't forget too that we have a training this evening, so the one that I was supposed to do last Thursday at four, um, my flights got all changed up and everything, and it was a mess. Um, so we are going to do that one today at four. So we have rev up um, today that we're jumping into right now, which is the farm and open houses. And then we're going to jump into tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, buyers, working with buyers. And then today at four, we're going to go over Barry's basics, how to navigate Barry's. Um, set up your 24 hours uh, watch, your um, search, how to set it up to show properties, like just some random stuff like that. I'm going to go through that for about an hour or so tonight um, at four o'clock. And then on Thursday at four o'clock, we're going to dive into zip forms a little bit more in depth so you know how to navigate zip forms. Okay. So that's kind of the plan for this week. Um, I'm trying to keep us on track to finish before summit happens. Um, here in a few weeks. So that's the plan. We'll wrap up, rev up, and our tech trainings by the time summit happens. And then summit will take place and we'll we'll start the schedule back over again. So hey, Amy? Yes. On the zip form one, um, are you going to go over the new buyer agreement? Since I am not. Uh, so on, um, my intention is on tomorrow for the buyer class that we will talk about the, the buyer rep agreement but not on the zip forms one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wait, tomorrow, questions? Amy, on what class? Tomorrow? Tomorrow at 11 is, uh, we're going over I'm working with buyers and we'll talk about oh, the buyer yeah, agreement that. during okay. that class. Okay. Hopefully I'll be done with physical therapy and back home by then. Cool. All right. Any other questions before we dive into developing a farm and hosting open houses? Woohoo! Let's go. All right, let's do this. So just so everybody knows too, um, we are not following the rev up plan. Shh, the secret. Um, I, in order to make it all work in the time frame that we have between now when we started and summit and with the holidays um, and to make it make sense in my mind because they had like um, developing a farm and marketing was the session. And then they had something else paired with open houses and it just seemed to make sense um, that farm and open houses, they're both types of lead gen. I combined them. I did the marketing and the database. I think it was open houses and database or something, but I combined the marketing and the database together. Um, so just so you know, if you rewatch some of the old rev ups that like Ed um, recorded and stuff, it's a little different this time around. So just a heads up on that. I don't know what we're going to do next time around. Maybe this follow this one, maybe something different. I may mix it up a little bit. I like variety, so I don't get bored. Um, anyways, <laughs> it's always new and fresh. So we're going to dive into developing a farm and hosting open houses. Both of these are um, both these are forms of lead generation, right? So as new agents, we need to identify our lead generation. Um, we did a 12 days of legion. You can catch that on the YouTube channel. Um, I believe it's also posted somewhere in the 
um, Foxhole group, as well as it was streamed live in the Foxhole. So, or at least some of them were. So you can find those. But when we talk about lead generation, you should have five legs of lead generation. One should always be sphere of influence. Those people that already know you, love you, and trust you, your database, right? We need to dive into our database because our database is our gold mine. And then we also need to generate leads from listings. So anytime you have a listing, you should generate leads. Somebody that can see that sign is going to sell their house right? That's what statistics show. So keep that in mind as well as you can um, develop buyer leads and different things from your leads from listings. So listings are a little treasures that help multiply your business. That's why we want to be listing based. And then you should select three other legs of lead gen. As a new agent, I highly recommend open houses. I think it's one of the easiest ways to lead generate, um, get your feet wet. It's not cold calls. It's not um, <coughs> business to business. It's just easy. It's easy, but that might not be your thing. So you don't have to do that. And then um, I always think that a farm is a good idea. Um, and your farm is going to be something. Developing your farm. And this is just an idea. It's not something that you have to do. Nobody says that you have to have a farm or that you have to do open houses. You do have to lead gen though, if you're going to be successful. So um, philosophy of farming, just so everybody knows farm. When I first got started in real estate, I thought it was like, oh, it's a farm. And it's kind of what it says there that, oh, you plant the seeds and you cultivate it and nurture it and it grows. And then it starts producing, you know, buyers and sellers, right? Well, it actually stands for, it's an acronym that stands for frequent area of repetitive marketing. I learned that um, from title and escrow. So frequent area of repetitive marketing. And I updated this where it should be marketing and prospecting, right? We should be prospecting based marketing enhanced. So the difference between prospecting and marketing is that prospecting is more labor intensive. Um, it's those face-to-face -face conversations or phone conversations. It's when we're actually communicating with people, building relationships versus marketing that is things like mailers, leaving something behind on their doorstep, whatever that is. So you should be prospecting based, right? Our goal is conversations and marketing enhanced. So as we're knocking on doors and having conversations, we're going to back that up with something showing up in their mailbox, right? We're just going to reiterate that. Or we may, um, they may see us again on an open house sign, right? Or at an open house in that farm. So just so you know, marketing, it should be prospecting based marketing enhanced, okay? Um, types of farms, there's lots of different types of farms. Um, geographic would be a farm based on a specific community, neighborhood, subdivision. This is where you might consider farming your own neighborhood or your own community because as a resident, you often have an advantage over other agents, right? Because you can let them know, hey, I'm your neighbor. I live around the corner. I drive by your house every day, right? So you have that advantage. There's a demographic farm. On a demographic farm, um, it's going to be uh, based on a specific demographic, hence the name demographic farm. Something like distressed sellers, first time home buyers, military, uh, high rental neighborhood, right? Something like that, or, or renters in general. So that would be a demographic farm. <clears throat> um, psychographic farm is based on a prospect's interests. Right. So you'd search for um, individuals with similar interests and connect with them. This one's a little bit more um, ambiguous, if you would. Um, so so it's just kind of you're going to connect with them in different ways. Right. Like uh, Bradley had his car show, right? So he's having a psychographic farm because he's trying to connect with other people that are interested in automobiles. OK, great example there. Um, <laughs> and I got them all geographic, demographic, and psychographic. So those are your three types of farms. The easiest one, honestly, is a geographic farm. Okay. So that's what we're going to focus in on mostly today is that geographic farm. The title company is going to be a great resource for you. We had Pamela speak last week from Old Republic Title Company. You got Ben Cox from um, Fidelity, I believe there's a rep from Placer Title. I can't think who they are, but connect with those reps from those title companies because they can be a great resource for your farm. So if you let them know what kind of farm you want to do, they can't help you with the psychographic farm, but your demographic or your uh, geographic farms, they can help um, 
they can help you with those lists and tell you what the turnover rates are. So that's super important. We'll dive into that a little bit more in the future, but they can get you farm packages um, full of useful information about your geographic farm um, or demographic breakdowns that you want to work with. It tells you, you know, it's an owner occupied, not owner occupied. You can get what the balance of the loan was when they bought the property or refinanced when it last um, sold. You can get all of the um, through the property profiles, you can get all the tax information, bedroom, bath count. Does it have a pool? Does it have a garage? Whatever that might be. Um, they also have farming systems and apps, right? So um, it, those are great ways to be able to, when you go out to walk your farm or connect with your farm to keep updated notes. Um, Old Republic Title Company has a great walking farm app. You can actually log into the app. You can identify where exactly your farm is based on the streets. <clears throat> um, you can draw like a little circle around it. You can save that. So it'll always be in that app for you. So all you have to do every time you go walk it is pull up that saved farm. And you can actually log in there and show it how you're going to walk the farm. And it'll put all the houses in order in the way that you're going to walk them. And then it's color coded. So it shows the ones that you've talked with before that you haven't talked with. It's got a place to add notes. Great way to track um, what's going on so that you know who you've talked with and who you haven't talked with or who was mean to you. And still go back to them. Even if they're mean to you, just try harder next time. Um, so, and to make notes, right? Like this guy yelled at me because I left something on his doorstep, right? Great way to leave those notes. So, you know, hey, next time don't leave it on his doorstep, leave it in his garage. Um, no, whatever. <laughs> so just, just little cool things like that. They have dogs that bark every time we ring the doorbell. So not quietly or, you know, whatever those little notes might be, or maybe... It's you ran into a family that has like five young kids and um, you wanted to leave them a little note. And so you, instead of knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell, because you're afraid you're going to wake up kids, um, you leave, leave a little note on their doorstep with whatever it was you had to leave behind. So great information in there. I think some of the other title companies also have a similar app, but it's not the ones that I've seen haven't been as intuitive as the one that Old Republic has. So that's my plug for their app. You have to talk with the rep in order to get those access to those apps. Um, title company can also supply you with a list of mailing addresses for the farm area. And just so you know, the title company can pull up um, farms based on either geographic or demographic. So if you're like, hey, I want all the houses in Vacaville that haven't sold in five years or more, right? Then they can pull those for you or a list of non-owner occupied homes for 95687. So they can pull that information for you. Um, make sure that you're within the RESPA guidelines when accepting materials from your vendor representatives. There's the little plug for, um, they can hand you information. They also have, um, most title companies have access to, it's called something, it's not called Title Pro, it's called something else, but um, it allows you to go in there and specify what you're looking for. Um, you can change all of your search criteria, loan amounts, um, you know, like LTV, loan to value amounts, um, how when it last sold, <clears throat> what kind of properties, whether it has a pool, doesn't have a pool, and you can pull that yourself through their site. Um, it does cost like pennies on the dollar, and you can also, usually with those, you can access um, whatever the phone number and the email address is on file if there is one. So just some little heads up there. Um, keep in mind when we're pulling phone numbers, we want to make sure we adhere to the National Do Not Call Registry. There, now you've got all my blurbs in one slide. <clears throat> Any questions so far? All right, we're just gonna keep plugging. How do we choose where to farm? That's totally up to you. Um, I don't think there's any wrong or right answer to this question. Um, you wanna start with, I would probably recommend, and when you first start with a farm, that you only bite off a chunk of about 100 homes. Okay, ultimately you want your farm to be at least 400 homes. So you wanna choose an area or a neighborhood that has at least 400 homes or a demographic that has at least 400 people in it. Um, Cause that's your goal 400 because um, anyways, turnover, that's how you're going to get like a solid return on your investment. However, I always recommend starting much smaller because it's a frequent area of repetitive marketing. And if we buy it off 400, we might get overwhelmed and we might only hit it every three months. And then it's not being effective because we're not frequently right. Repetitively marketing those properties. So um, I recommend starting with 100 homes. Once you're consistent in those 100 homes, you've been good for like two or three months. Um, going by those homes or 
enacting whatever your plan is, because your plan might be different, um, for two to three months, then add another 100 homes to it. And then another 100, maybe by the end of the year, you're up to your 400 homes. It's a great way to do it where it's manageable. You're biting it off, right? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So how do you start a farm just 100 houses at a time, or maybe even 50, right? Maybe each month we have 50 in there so that we don't feel overwhelmed. It can take a while to walk 400 homes. So if you don't have a system in place for that, or you don't feel good with like how long it's taking you to walk 100 each month, then you're gonna feel overwhelmed and you're just not gonna do it. So we want you to be successful. Um, there is a farm analysis spreadsheet tool that I can give you, but the easiest way is identify your farm, shoot it over to the title company, ask them what the turnover rate is. The title company can tell you that. You don't have to do any math, woohoo. Um, your goal for a turnover rate should be like four and a half or more for a turnover rate. Um, it just makes the numbers work out for you and you can kind of calculate out what that potential return is going to be. However, that being said, I don't know if it was Heather or not. I feel like it was Heather was like, nobody, no homes sell in my neighborhood. And I said, yes, it was. And I said, well, that's not necessarily a bad thing because you know, unless it's a brand new neighborhood, right? Like only a year old, if you're talking about a neighborhood that's been in existence for a while and it hasn't had a big turnover in the last year, so your turnover numbers are going to be a little bit lower, right? Our turnover rate is the number of homes that have sold against the total number of homes in that farm. That's how we get our turnover rate. Um, but if homes haven't sold recently, there's a good chance homes are going to start coming on the market. Okay, so I don't necessarily live and die off that turnover rate. Um, I would look at the neighborhood as a whole. Okay. Um, we want to make sure that it's a farm you want to do business in. Maybe the neighborhood you live in is like, these are not the people that I want to help. Maybe... <laughs> you, um, it's a dangerous neighborhood. Maybe you're like, man, I wouldn't feel comfortable walking door to door in this neighborhood or hosting an open house in this neighborhood. Or maybe you're like, man, these homes are such high end. I live in such a high end neighborhood that there's I, like to walk 400 homes because they're bigger lots and really spaced out. It's going to take a really long time. I don't want that much exercise. Um, and so maybe you want like a middle of the road neighborhood. So make sure you kind of look and choose based on, you know, look at the neighborhood and what that's going to entail. Make sure it's walkable. If you live in the country, like walking 400 homes in the country, probably not happening. Maybe take your horse though. I mean, if you got a horse and you got country properties, like ride house to house, I don't know, take your little quad and, and go do it. your side by side. Um, but so keep those things in mind, right? Like how long is this going to take? How am I going to be able to, to have relationship? Our goal is building relationships. So when you have a farm, you ultimately want to be able to meet these people face to face because it's much easier to build relationship face to face than it is not. Um, so there's a lot of things to take into account there. Um, look at what the average sales price is for the last 12 months, right? We already talked about the turnover rate. Um, and then you can calculate kind of out what your potential return is. Your goal is kind of 20% of the sales in that neighborhood that you're going to capture by making it your farm. So what does that calculate out to? That's why we talk about like 400 homes and, you know, turnover rate closer to 5%. <laughs> so that's kind of where we get those numbers from, in case anybody was wondering. Um, and then we also want to look at agent saturation right? Is there another agent that's, that has all of the listings in that neighborhood? Is there another agent that's already knocking on doors, right? If somebody already, if there's an agent that already has 80 to 90% of the market share in that neighborhood, choose another market. They've already created themselves as like the neighborhood expert. You're going to be working against not only trying to build relationship with people, but you're also working against the fact that this other agent's already ingrain themselves in their mind that they are the neighborhood expert. So um, just go on and find another one. You can do all that through berries and we can show you how to do that in the berries training tonight at four o'clock. Okay, so research and choose a farm. Um, research the neighborhood, right? And like I said already, kind of um, what features are positive? What does that neighborhood have to offer? What are the negatives? Um, preview any active properties on the market, see what's out there, and just kind of do a nice physical inspection of the neighborhood. Understand once you choose that farm, you should understand kind of the layout of the streets, how everything rolls. Um, you should know what floor plans. Most neighborhoods have like five floor plans, 
if that. Sometimes they only have like three floor plans, right? And then you can tell from the outside of the house, from looking at them, what each of those floor plans are. So go preview some properties that are on the market, get to know the floor plans, get to know what it looks out like, um, understand. So if somebody's like, man, they go through an open house in that farm that you're hosting and they're like, man, I like this, but I really need a four bedroom model or I really need a model with a bedroom on the bottom floor, you're going to know exactly what houses in that neighborhood have that feature, okay? Um, features and benefits, right? Um, look and just see, positively affect values, negatively affect values. If it backs, you know, like open space or undeveloped lots, go figure out, go down to the city and figure out what those lots are slated to become if there is a plan for those lots so that you know what the potential future of that neighborhood looks like, right? Are they going to put in condos there? Are they putting in low-income housing units? Like, what's the plan? Um, also, make sure you understand, like, which roads back up to busy streets, which ones have power poles or power lines that, that pass through them. So just really get to know the neighborhood. <clears throat> Um, we kind of talked about this already, um, how many homes, what the turnover rate is, how long to walk, um, pertinent information, right? So we kind of took um, account of all this. Oh, um, something else that you could look for is look for damages or graffiti, right? Look for things that maybe need to be repaired or corrected, and maybe even take the action of calling that into the right um, people in the city in order to get some of those things remedied, right? Or if there's a wall that's got a bunch of graffiti on it, take it upon yourself to like go out there, maybe even host as like one of your opening events in your farm, like a graffiti painting day <clears throat> where you throw it out there to all the neighbors and say, hey, let's meet up on Saturday at nine. I'll have paint and brushes and we'll paint the graffiti. Please make sure you get city approval before you do that because they usually have specific colors and different things and they can help you with that. So connect with the city, but that would be a great way to do that. Um, maybe if there's like a big park and the park's really dirty or whatever, have like a park cleanup day, right? Super fun. All right, tips on walking your farm. I feel like there was something that I was thinking of on the last one. So hold on, I went backwards. No, all right, so. Highly recommend the best way to work a farm is to walk it. To go door knock the doors, try to have conversations. I always bring something with me when I go walk my farm, something of value. We'll talk about that here in a minute that I can leave behind. So if somebody doesn't answer their door, I have something to leave behind um, so that I can help build that relationship for those that don't answer their doors. So when you walk your farm, please be comfortable and professional, right? Please don't wear heels when you go walk your farm. You're going to be miserable. Unless you're just one of those people that you're super comfortable in heels and you could go walk five or six miles in heels, then by all means wear heels. But don't feel like you have to. Wear tennis shoes. Get like a nice, you know, Realty One group. Um, not only in the office do they have some options, but online you can go. They have an apparel store. Like pick up a couple of like a cute polo or some... Um, you know, a little jacket, something that casual that says you're out working, but identifies you as a real estate agent and makes you look kind of casual professional. Okay. <clears throat> um, the best time to walk your farm is anytime you're actually going to do it. Okay. So don't feel like you got to wait until the evening to walk your farm because more people will be home. Those are lies. People are busy in the afternoons. They don't want to answer their door in the afternoon, just like they don't want to answer their door in the morning. They are on the weekends or on the weekdays. It doesn't matter. Just block that time on your calendar and go do it. Okay. And maybe, um, you know, for consistency sake, you may be like, hey, I walk my farm the first week of the month, every month at 9 a.m. Totally fine. Or you may decide that, hey, this month I'm going to walk it at nine. Next month I'm going to walk it at 11. Then I'm going to bounce back to nine, or maybe I'm going to try one, right? So you may bounce some different days or different times around, and you can chunk it up. So if you have 100 homes, you may be like, hey, I walk 50 today and 50 tomorrow. So on Mondays and Tuesdays, I walk 50 homes. And then as you add the next 100, you could do that the week too, right? So we still aren't adding more to our schedule each week. We're just adding um, more farmhouses to our schedule each month by breaking it up into smaller chunks. Um <clears throat> notepads or tablet we kind of talked about that app or bring a notepad around make notes I had like a whole pad of paper and I would write down the street number 
Um, well, usually I used kind of like one page per street as we turned corners or did courts or whatever. And then I would just be able to write the numbers down and then whatever my interaction was with the people on that court so that I could make those notes into my database once I was done. Okay, you wanna be able to make notes. What did you talk about? What were their names? Did they have dogs? Get their dogs' names. Did they have cats, um, kids, right? So anything that you interact with, um, make sure you get that information. If you're like, Amy, what am I even going to talk about? I even have notes to write down. This is scary. Um, Ford, right? Family, occupation, recreation, dreams. That's going to be your goal. Your first time around is just going to be introducing yourself. I've got a little farm letter I will um, share with you guys here shortly. Um, that just introduces yourself as, hey, you know, I'm Amy, I work with Realty One Group Fox, I'm here, I'm going to come around on a regular basis and just keep you up to date of what's going on in this neighborhood, as far as real estate's concerned, and maybe some other fun things that we might do as a neighborhood, right? So you're just going to introduce yourself. And then each time after that, you just want to try to connect with them. I usually brought something, like I said, of value with me. So I usually brought um, like a postcard, like a five by seven postcard on one side had like market stats, right? What is on the market? What's the market doing? What's in contract? What is sold? So they're kept aware of what's going on. And then on the back side, I had something else that was fun, like um, fun summer activities to do in the Solano County area. Um, maybe if, you know, like in the summer, the ice rink offers reduced skate cost if it's over 100 degrees or bowling does the same thing or maybe there's a summer movie series at the theater or um you know if it's near a high school or something you may want to as new sports start like put out the home sports schedule or um maybe your favorite football team that's a good way to start conversations when you knock on people's doors to show up with like the raiders football schedule right because then people are either like yay or nay there's no in between right same thing with like the cowboys there's no in between they either like them they don't uh it's not like the Bengals. people are like oh the Bengals. who cares <laughs> right? like, doesn't polarize <laughs> you're something that's gonna start some conversation but just bring maybe in the spring you could bring around like uh, spring tips for getting your house in order or preparing your house for winter as winter is coming up, right? So there's lots of fun things. There's cool postcards already in the Realty One um, One Design Creative Space Suite. Creative Suite, I think is what it's called. There's already postcards in there. There's like um, fun things like sports schedules. There's recipes. There's holiday specific ones. So there's lots of fun things in there that you can just use and snag and make really super simple. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about business cards. My, uh, I'm going to have a postcard that's got my information on it. So if they want my information, it's on the postcard. And ultimately my goal is going to be to get their information so I can update their information in my database versus just handing them out my information. And then we want to make sure we um, as we connect with people, we verse, we tag them as either connected or not connected, right? Did we have a conversation with them? Did we not have a conversation with them? It goes back to that captured versus connected, which is my favorite thing, right? So somebody who's not connected, but we, we've got their information. We call those captured like a zoo animal. If we call them, they don't come. They may try to eat us um, versus somebody who's connected is going to be like our pet dog. They remember our name. They remember our face. They know who we are. Okay, and then that walking farm app that we already talked about. All right, so those are some tips on walking your farm. Um, if you're not comfortable walking your farm by yourself, partner with, um, there's different options. You could partner with a lender, an insurance agent, a home inspector, a pest inspector, right? Somebody who else is gonna benefit with those relationships or partner up with another agent where you're walking your farm, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and then you're walking their farm with them on Wednesday, Thursday, right? So. Um, whatever that would be, just kind of share the responsibility, but that way there's some security there in just not being out by yourself, knocking on people's doors. We don't want to have any missing agents show up. <laughs> um, <laughs> your marketing materials, introduction, announcement letter. I already talked about that. I'm going to share one with you. Just introduces yourself, who you are, and lets them know that, hey, I'm going to come by consistently and I'm going to keep you updated of what's going on in the market, what's going on in our specific neighborhood. And um, and hold you accountable to those actions. Okay. You could do a monthly newsletter, right? So that would be like, maybe from there on, we have a monthly newsletter. Like I said, I did the monthly update of stats for our farm every month. Um, and then some fun things, 
create a, um, whatever area you're farming, create a social media group for that farm where the neighbors can share information. Like next door is cool, but it's kind of hard to pinpoint your exact neighborhood on next door because all the neighborhoods seem to get information from everywhere else. Um, so create a social media page and that way somebody who, you know, they lose their dog or whatever, they can post it in there and you can keep them up to date of any activities or events you're going to do. Um, market updates and holiday creatives. Okay, any questions so far? All right, methods of deliveries. There's two specific ways to deliver goods. Well, there's three technically, because I told you to start a social media group. <clears throat> you can walk your farm. That would be prospecting. Walking our farm is prospecting. We're trying to have conversations, ultimately leading to conversations about real estate, which ultimately lead to buyers and sellers. Um, you can mail things to your farm. That would be marketing. So if you want to be prospecting based on marketing enhanced, we could walk our farm and then we could also send something out in the mail to them. You've got a social media presence. So I would um, create that group, invite people to the group and then start sharing pertinent, helpful information in that group. Once you create that group for that neighborhood, I probably wouldn't allow any other realtors into my, my neighborhood group. I want to be the realtor of choice and the neighborhood expert. So I would deny any requests for people that wanted to join that were real estate agents. <clears throat> and you probably wanna do a combo approach to this. And you may decide that, man, my schedule is just way too hectic. I've got kids and another job and school or whatever it is going on in your life. So maybe one month you walk your farm and the next month you mail stuff to the farm. And then you walk your farm and then you mail stuff. So you're walking it six times a year and you're mailing it 12 times a year. And then as you gain more time or more freedom, um, you can begin walking it more often. Okay. Any questions about your farm? Before we move on to open houses, look, I'm right on schedule. It's 1133 and we're moving on to open houses. I'm really proud of myself. Anastasia, did you have a question? No, ma'am. <laughs> it's a little things in life. All right. So we're going to move on from farm to keep in mind that any of those um, methods and anything that we just talked about, you could apply to most of that was geographic farming, but you could apply it to demographic farming as well, though it's much harder to like door knock on a demographic farm. So most of your um, service is going to be reaching out via mail, which means that you want to make sure you have a call to action on those mailers that they reach out to you. Oh, something we didn't even talk about. All right. Hold on. Now I'm going to be behind. All right. We're backing up to developing your marketing materials. Some fun things to do in your farm, um, especially if it's a geographic farm is, to, and you could do this with a demographic farm as well. Just so you know, you could do like a pumpkin carving contest where they send you pictures of your pumpkin, of their pumpkins when they carve them, like around Halloween. And you have everybody vote on their favorite pumpkin and then you give them like some sort of a gift card, right? So you could do that both demographic or, um, or geographic. Um, or maybe you do like a coat drive, right? Or like a blanket drive for the SPCA, or maybe you host a national night out event, right? So we can do some really fun things inside our farm. We had one of our agents did a um, 4th of July bike parade, which was super fun on the morning of 4th of July. So you can make it really fun and interactive. Uh, you could host a garage sale weekend um, where everybody um, you know, puts out their garage sale on the same weekend. So you're driving traffic through. We're almost to garage sale season again. So that would be a good activity to do. So there's lots of fun things. So don't feel like you've got to be restricted to knocking on people's door and leaving things behind or mailing things. We can make it really fun and interactive and make it um, so that they see that you're involved in the community, helping other people, that there's more than just, I want to sell your house, that you're really trying to build relationship and make it fun for the people that live in that neighborhood. All right. Moving on to hosting great open houses. Um, so lead gen, right? Open houses are a great form of lead generation. It allows you the ability both to be prospecting based and marketing enhanced. Um, the actual open house itself is us crossing our fingers and hoping people show up. So a lot of what happens in hosting great open houses happens before the open house and after the open house, okay? We'll dive into that more. Um, so the benefits 
of the open houses. Agents either love them or hate them, but if you have a good attitude about them, you can learn to love them. I don't really truly like people. I don't like being around strangers. I think, you know, deep down inside, I was ingrained with like stranger danger growing up. No, I'm just an introvert. It's exhausting to be around people all the time. Hence the reason I moved to North Idaho. Um, there's not people. <laughs> so, um, but open houses are a great way to like fake it till you make it and like have a great attitude going in. It's a great way to generate leads and it's a really inexpensive way to generate leads. Um, you get good exposure, marketing exposure for your active um, saleable listing inventory. Um, and you also get more recognition because you have signs out, right? So people are seeing your signs, especially if you're hosting open houses inside your farm, right? It's just that prospecting based marketing enhanced. Um, it's a great investment of your time because it can be a good cost effective way time wise um, of lead generation um, if done properly. Okay. And if worst case scenario is if nobody shows up to your open house, I'm going to show you how to do a bunch of work up front before the open house. So you've already made connections around that open house, but you can also set yourself up for success by catching up on admin tasks, follow-up calls, putting those systems and processes in place on your computer or laptop while you're sitting there waiting for people to show up. Okay. Um, preparation and planning is required for a successful open house. So as previously mentioned, your attitude is everything. Go into your open house assuming and knowing that it's going to be a productive activity. My goal with every open house was to walk away with one potential buyer or seller lead. If I walked away with one lead, I was happy. If my goal was to close 20 units and I knew that I was going to host two open houses a month, right? There's 12 months, that's 24 open houses. If I walked away with one buyer or seller lead per open house, chances were I was going to hit my goals for the year without doing anything else, without my leads from listings, without my database, without anything else. I knew if I could walk away with one per open house that I would hit my goals. <clears throat> Plan and prepare. Know the property and the market. Okay. Know where you're hosting your open houses. We'll talk about selecting the right open houses here shortly, but just know what's going on. So as we talk about how to prepare for your upcoming open house, we'll talk about, you know, pulling the other active listings in the area, knowing el what else is on the market is key. Um, and just know what's going on in the market and specifically in that neighborhood. And also dress professionally, right? You're hosting this open house with the intention of meeting up with somebody that's going to hire you to either help them purchase a home or sell a home. So make sure you dress professionally or be you, okay? So if you is a hoodie and jeans, then be you because don't show up to the open house differently. You're going to show up to your buyer appointment or to go show them properties. Be you. <clears throat> Selecting your property that you're going to hold open. Number one, you don't have to hold your listings open. So if you're like, Amy, this is stupid because I don't have any listings. No, it's not. Hold somebody else's listings open. There's generally posts in the foxhole just about every week of people saying, hey, I've got an open house opportunity. Who wants to host an open house? You can go in the berries. You can search our office listings and see who has listings that are active and available. Great way to go in there, reach out to the agent in our office and be like, hey, can I host your home open, host your home open? Somebody will let you host their open house or even, hey, let's be really proactive and forget about this week. Let's talk about a week or two weeks out. Hey, Anastasia, what listings do you have coming on the market in two weeks? I would love to hold them open for you so you can have your weekends back. Right? Great. Thank you. Carly, Carly just emailed an open house opportunity. See? All the time. I see them all the time. So there's always open house opportunities or go find one. Just so everybody knows, our office policy is that the open house should be um, by one of our agents. Okay, that's the office policy. Okay. Um, host your own listings open whenever it's appropriate and choose listings that are in great locations. Okay. We don't want to choose a house to hold open that they have to make 15 turns to get to. You will lose people. They will turn around and quit before they get there. And you have to have that many signs anyways. So chances are it's not going to happen. So um, 
houses near busy intersections, busy streets, good access points, you know, off the busy street, straight line, great way, um, great look, those would be considered great locations. Also make sure you know the neighborhood and make sure you feel safe sitting in that home, hosting it open. Um, I would say by yourself, but really you shouldn't be hosting open houses by yourself anyways. So build relationships with other people so that you can host those open houses. It's a security thing not to sit in a, in a house by yourself for both the house and yourself. Um, I recommend partnering with lenders, home insurance, um, right? Uh, home inspectors, whoever that might be that might benefit from sitting in that open house with you as well. And it could be a benefit to those people passing through, right? So now number one choice would be a lender. We're not competing for leads. We're working together to make each other's goals happen. So find a lender that's willing to go sit in an open house with you. We're supposed to refer three lenders out anyways. So you might have one lender that's helping you do your farm, right? We can co-brand with a lender on our farm and help share the cost that way. We might have another lender that's helping us with open houses. And we might have one lender that we just love. Who knows? There should still be some sort of reciprocal relationship, even with that lender that you love. So sitting in an open house is a benefit and a reason to have a relationship with a lender. They get all the leads from the open house. They help you pre-qualify buyers so that they're ready to move forward and purchase. Um, we talked about all of those things. All right, so we're good there. Any questions about selecting the property? What I've been, no, but what I've been doing is I bring up the, the listing and then I map it out and I figure where I'm going to place my signs so I know beforehand. Perfect. And Absolutely. I know how many signs I need. Yes, that is a great plan, which I think is on the next slide. We'll talk about preparing, but that selecting the signs ahead of time so you know right. how many signs you need and where, no, don't be sorry. And where they go is huge, right? Um, the other thing that I was going to mention is if I'm hosting an open house for somebody else and I have some options of homes to hold open, I will always choose the vacant listing before an occupied listing just for safety and security. I don't have to worry about anything walking out the door if the house is vacant. Um, all right. This says um, selecting. Oh, hey, look, vacant versus occupied properties. Um, all right. Invest in personalized yard and open house signs. Um, so make sure you've got your own open house signs. If you don't have your own, don't let that stop you from doing open houses. Borrow somebody else's signs. We used to loan out our signs all the time. In fact, I think um, Shannon and I probably used our open house signs like twice ever in our lives, and they were used almost every weekend by other agents. So borrow somebody else's signs. It's totally okay. Besides, I got free promo that way. Um, but it's a good way to, like, if we don't have the money to invest in signs right now, um, it's a good way to not hold you back from moving forward on your goals. You can also pick up, like, at the association, they have the unbranded signs for, like, 30 bucks a piece. They're not great, but, you know, you could pick up a couple of those, like, five, six, seven, eight of those, right, for pennies on the dollar versus having your own personalized ones done right away. And then after you have a closing, make sure you budget for some open house signs that are... Uh, branded to you that have your information on them because it comes down to that prospecting based marketing enhanced. We want people to see our signs and think we're all over town. Um, hold the open houses in your farm area. Aim for that first. I always look at my farm first. I always look at my own listings first, then my farm. And then outside of that, um, we talked about vacant versus occupied homes that I always aim for vacant homes. Occupied homes show better. They're prettier. They have furniture and stuff in them. They look lived in. They're easier to sell. But ultimately, our goal for the open house isn't to sell the property. It's to lead generate, right? So only 1% of properties actually sell by an open house. So our goal is lead generation. So we don't really care what the inside of the property looks like um, as long as people are coming through the doors. And then weekdays versus weekends right? Is there one that's better? No, they all work. Just be strategic about your times and odds of good attendance. So if we're doing like a weekday, we probably want to do it later in the afternoon, evening, especially if it's near like a school or whatever, because you've got people picking kids up from school. Maybe they're tired of like driving across town. So they're looking to move to that neighborhood. Um, weekends, again, take into account what's going on in people's lives. Is there a big football game? Is it Super Bowl Sunday? Is there um, you know, do people go to church in the early morning on Sunday? 
is there a big soccer game going on in the park across the street from the house on Saturday? And so maybe we want to wait until later so that people don't see how crowded and busy the streets get during the soccer games. So just take all of that into account when choosing your days and times. Now, if I'm going to be sitting in the office working on admin activities, is that something I can do from an open house? Yes. Is it more likely that I'm going to meet somebody sitting in an open house than it is sitting in the office? Absolutely. So what's to stop you from sitting in an open house almost every day of the week if there's one available, right? So um, just some things to think about. If you've got some admin time blocked in your schedule, like putting out some signs, hosting it open and being there, um, great way to use that time appropriately. Um, you want to make sure that you have a minimum of six open house signs and up to probably about 12 open house signs. And keep in mind that it could be a mix. We want them all to look the same so that people can follow them to the right house. Otherwise, on like busy weekends, they might get sidetracked to somebody else's open house. But you might have some sandwich board signs, you know, that are like a frame and you might have some that like stick in the ground. As long as they look the same on the actual thing, that's okay. Those ones that stick in the ground, that corrugated, like glossy cardboard on the little stakes, super inexpensive ways to boost your number of open house signs. You can never have too many open house signs. I promise. There's never such thing as too many open house signs. Make sure the arrows on both sides are facing the right way though. Okay. So we've had some problems with this before that like, you know, they submit the same design for both front and back. And if you do that on the front, it points this way on the back, it points the other way. So we have to have opposite arrows. Um, so just something to keep in mind. I generally don't have business cards on hand. I can now keep some in my pocket and I don't put them out because again, my goal is to get contact information, not give contact information. I want to be in charge of the connection. Um, I also, so this is your open house kit. I also don't like having paper at an open house. I don't like people being able to like walk away with things because again, I'm trying to trade value for their information. So I usually create a Google Drive folder. So I go into my Google Drive, create a folder. I label it the property address. And inside that property address, I'm going to put my area info. I may put the buyer handbook. I may put any um, personalized marking material for that property, the open house flyer, whatever that might be. Um, property disclosures, I'm going to throw them all in that. Now, at the open house itself, I may have a copy of all of those things. So that people can look through them when they're at the open house and know they're available. And then they're like, man, can I get a copy of this inspection report? I'm like, yes, absolutely. Would you like me to text it or email it to you? Right now I've made sure that their information is accurate. Okay. Um, but I don't generally just have this laying out on the counter, taking up space so that people can take one and walk away. I want their correct, accurate information. Um, so you want to make sure property disclosures. Um, Clipboard and evaluation sheets or a sign-in sheet, right? If it's our listing, or even if it's a listing for someone else, like I want to be the agent that they call to always host their open houses. So I want to provide as much feedback as possible about the house to another agent. So I prefer evaluation sheets versus just like a blanket sign-in sheet where they actually have to like answer some questions about what they thought of the property. Because now I can provide the seller feedback, whether it's my seller or somebody else's seller. Um, there is in Real Scout, I think it's Real Scout. They have, you can download the app and you can actually have people register on your app. So if you have like a tablet or whatever, that's a great idea to have people register. It goes straight into a database so that you don't have a bunch of piece, pieces of paper floating around. I am a fan of paper only because I don't like people touching my electronics or sometimes they don't work like they're supposed to and paper never fails me. Also, it allows me to make notes on the piece of paper. So if somebody walks through the open house, they sign in at the door with their sign-in sheet, or they hand me their evaluation at the end, and I can make notes of who that person was, who else was with them, what they thought of the house, what our conversation entailed. So it gives me a good way to kind of make some notes there on the fly where I don't have to look like I'm staring at my phone when other people are passing through the house. Um, bring bottled waters if you want to. Um, I have never had, I don't, I don't feel like I've ever lost a potential buyer or a seller that's passed through an open house because I didn't have something for them to eat or drink as they passed through the open house. So that's up to you. If you have a water budget, 
bring waters. If you don't have a water budget, don't bring waters. If you have a water budget and you've had a couple of closings, get personalized labels. So they're branded to you because that's really fun. Um, if it's a vacant home, bring tables and chairs. I always had like a little uh, TV tray that I would bring to set by the front door, which is where I had people sign in. Um, they say a flashlight and pens. I'd probably replace a flashlight. Most people have a phone that has flashlights on them now, but I'd probably replace that with a measuring tape, like a 25 foot measuring tape because it never fails. Somebody needs to measure if their couch will fit, if their boat will fit in the garage, whatever that might be, they want a measuring tape. All right, see here. Um, preparation and promotion. So here's where we go into the prospecting. So as Anastasia mentioned, we should, if you haven't been in the property before, this isn't what she mentioned, but you should go visit the property maybe before the open house to get to know the property, make sure you don't have any questions for the listing agent. If it's not your property, which chances are, if you haven't been in the property before, you may not know all the features and things in the property. So go schedule a quick walkthrough earlier in the week that you can just spend five minutes walking through the house. If the seller's there, that's even better because you can ask them questions and see if there's anything that you should know about the property to be able to mention during the open house. It's also a good time if the seller's there to mention to the seller, which is something anytime you schedule an open house, you should either send it out to your sellers or make sure you send it out to the listing agent so they can prep their sellers to make sure that they tuck away any valuables and medication. And I usually recommend they don't tuck them in the top drawers. They put them in a middle or bottom drawer because people are less likely to open a middle or bottom drawer than they are a top drawer. Um, but to tuck away those valuables and medications in preparation for the open house. And I usually reassure them that we've never had anything walk out the door. I never have had anything walk out the door and we want to keep it that way. So just make sure the house is prepared and ready to go. Um, I also let them know that I'm going to show up about 30 minutes before the open house and I'll be there about 30 minutes after it closes. That allows me to get to the house to get it ready, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, as Anastasia mentioned, calculate the number of directional signs needed and plan placement in advance, right? So look it up, Google map it, figure out how many signs you need, where those signs are going to go. Um, it's okay to pay somebody to place your signs for you. Okay, I know. You don't have to do it, especially if it's raining or it's really hot, because then you show up either looking like a drowned rat or a sweaty rat when you show up to host your open house. So have somebody else do the signs for you. If you've got a spouse, a kid, like pay them a few bucks to go put the signs out, make them a little map, show them ahead of time how you want the signs laid out, right? Like how they should be pointing, what the end goal is, like make them see the vision. Um, I had somebody that I, every weekend was my open house sign person. I paid them every weekend and they just knew that they knew how I wanted the signs. I would give them the map. They would go get them from me. I'd show up 30 minutes early to the house to get it open and ready. They'd come pick out the signs and start putting them out. Then they'd show up about five minutes before the close of the open house and start picking up those signs so that either at or shortly thereafter the close of the open house, all my signs were picked up and returned to me. Amy. Yes. Um, what I did was on the um, open house signs that I have, I have a spot for a writer on the top. Uh -huh. So what I did was I bought blank writers and then I do the dry erase marker and I put um, the time and the address. Perfect. That, That's a great that idea. Yeah, that makes it easier for people to find those signs, right? They don't have to look for the sign. They can see the time and the address and head on over. Super easy. Um. Gain permission in advance if there's signs that need to be placed on private property and make sure you know the city or county laws with regards to sign and sign placements. So like don't put them in the middle of the road, don't block the sidewalks. So it's a really good idea to go in ahead of time, knock on somebody's door, leave them a message if they're not there and be like, hey, I've got an open house over on, you know, Canary Court this weekend. Do you mind if I set my open house sign just right on the edge of your lawn? I'd really appreciate it. And then maybe if they allowed you to, maybe drop them off a little gift card or a send them a thank you note. Um, after that, it's a good way to write where, again, we're building relationship with people. So this is a good opportunity for prospecting. <laughs> um, 
If you have other properties in the area or neighborhood, make sure you know the inventory, know what's out there. That's something else that I always put in my Google Drive is I think about the subject property that I'm holding open. And I think about if somebody didn't want this house, why would they not want it? And what would they be looking for? If it's a three bedroom home, maybe I pull a list of all the four bedroom homes. Or maybe if it's on a small lot, maybe I pull a list of all the properties on big lots in the area. Or if it's in a certain school district, maybe I put all the other homes in that school district. Um, and then I have all of those lists in my Google Drive. So somebody's like, we're having a conversation as part of the open house. And they're like, man, we really like this house, but we we're really hoping for a four bedroom home. I can be like, hey, no problem, Lonnie. I've got a list of all of the four bedroom homes available. Do you want me to send that over to you? They're gonna be like, oh my gosh, yes, please do, right? So great thing to have in that Google Drive as well. Um, as part of our preparation, as part of our prospecting piece to our open house, we want to invite the neighbors. Okay, we want to go door knock at least, I would say, make it a goal of 50 homes per open house. Maybe we do 10 each way and 15 across the street, right? 10, 10 is 20 and 15. No, that's 35, 25 across the street, Shh, 30, 30 across the street. I'll get there eventually. Math is not my strong suit today. Um, door knock. I had little door hangers that I created with a little blank space on them that said, you're invited to an open house. And it allowed me to print up clear labels, stick them on there with the date and time and the address of the open house, right? Neighbors are going to come by anyways, invite them to the open house. It's a good time to have a conversation with them. If they open their door to say, Hey, just a heads up, like I'm hosting an open house down the street this weekend on both Saturday and Sunday, or just Saturday or Friday and Saturday, whatever those are. And um, you know, there might be a little bit more traffic than normal. I'm apologizing in advance for the inconvenience that's going to cause you. Um, and if you want to come check out the house, you're welcome to. Or, you know, if you know anybody, you're the biggest, you know, proponent for this neighborhood. You already live here. Who do you know that would love to live in this neighborhood with you? It's a great time to pick your neighbors. Right. Great way to prospect. Maybe pick up some referrals or leads or get them to send people to the open house. Okay. Um, if you have phone numbers, call in addition, right? Go door knock. I would door knock a couple days in advance. I would also call to follow up and invite them to the open house and just say, hey, who do you know that should move to this neighborhood? Now's a great time to pick your neighbors. Um, you're going to send an invitation to your circle of influence, right? Who do you know that's local or might know somebody that wants to move local, that wants to know about this house that you're hosting open, or maybe just wants to come visit you? <clears throat> right? Who else should you invite, right? That's your who. That's your main question. Like, hey, who should you know about this house that's coming up for sale that I'm holding open? Okay, so this is a huge part of this open house process is the circle prospecting and knocking on doors and inviting friends, family, and neighbors because it gives you those additional touches to somebody that can see that sign and to other people in your database. This is the prospecting piece of the open houses. Any any questions about this? No, ma'am. All right. Um, coordinate your advertising, right? So we want to make sure that we have um, like flyers if you're going to go knock on doors. Um, or door hangers or postcards, right? We want to make sure that it's going to get posted on your social media, like figure out what the housing groups are in the area to post it to. Like, is there a Solano County open houses group or homes for sale group? Is there, um, if I am cross or having an open house in Vacaville, would somebody from the Bay Area maybe be interested in moving to the to Vacaville, right? You get way more house for way less money. So are there open house groups or homes for sale groups in those areas that I could post in as well that I could share it in? So think about kind of outside the box, who could I share this with? What other neighborhoods, if it's a really nice neighborhood, is there a neighborhood that's kind of like a move up neighborhood? So, you know, like if it's Cheyenne and Browns Valley and, you know, the regular Browns Valley, people who live in Browns Valley love Browns Valley. So they may want to stay in Browns Valley, but they may need more space. So maybe I'm marketing to those homes that are like 2,400 square feet to see if they're ready to move up to a 3,500 square foot home, right? So we can think outside the box of who do we need to market this open house to? 
Um, it should get posted in the MLS. Make sure the agent, if you're not the listing agent, make sure they put it in the MLS with the times and the dates. Um, and there's like a little info box where you can leave like remarks that get posted to the public. Make sure your name is in there, hosted by Heather Garcia, right? Totally okay to do that. Um, that should, once it's in the MLS, it should syndicate it out to all of the other sites, the Zillow's, the Realtors, the Homes.com, all those different sites. It should push it out there, which is really important that if you plan an open house, you show up to your open house because once it's out there, you can't pull it back. It goes out really easy. It doesn't come back really easy. So it's really hard to cancel an open house. If something happens and you do need to cancel an open house, um, leave a note on the door so that the occupants not irritated or people that were coming to this open house because they saw the promotion for it don't get irritated and just let them know that I'm very sorry the open house was canceled. Maybe even leave like some cards or tear offs or something there that says if you would like to view it at another time, we can set that up for you. Please give me a call right with your contact information. Um, make sure that it's on your website. You can do, um, in addition to the like the sign writers that Anastasia puts on her open house signs, you can also put a sign writer on the main for sale sign in the neighborhood, letting people know that it's going to be open on Saturday from 12 to 2. There's always little slots up there or hangers on the bottom of the sign. So get some sign writers where you can um, do it like what Anastasia does with the dry erase markers and you can write it in. <clears throat> Okay. If uh, if you always do open houses like generally at the same time, then you could have some signs made so you make sure they don't wipe off or run off. That always says, you know, Saturday 12 to 2 or some of them have like blank. So it says open Saturday blank to blank and then you just fill in the times. So there's lots of options there. Um, create a video announcement, right? Super cool way to promote it. And videos get different play on social media than like regular posts do, as well as like reels and stories get different play than regular posts and videos do. So do all of the methods of promotion when it comes to online and social media. And you can always boost those ads on Facebook, okay? Or Instagram, or um, uh, they have... On like Google and stuff, you can post them as well. So there's some great ways to get it out there to a bigger audience than just your circle of influence. Make sure you get it out there. This, this whole piece right here is super important to make sure that we're drawing people in so that people are aware of the open house, they want to come to the open house, and they, they show up. Okay. Um... Again, when it comes to preparing for your open house, um, I said Google Drive. Oops, hold on. I clicked one too many times. Um, inside that Google Drive, I would have like the MLS data sheet, right? That has all the details about the property, the property flyer, maybe a copy of the plot map, um, which you can get usually from the listing agent or you can get it from your title rep can set you up on a way to be able to download those plot maps. Um, maybe any nearby school information, nearby businesses, all the features of the property, anything that's been upgraded or updated, right? Um, and then I would also go ahead and prepare like a CMA for the property so that you have an idea of, hey, here's what it's listed at and here's all the comps that support those values. In addition to this, again, I would have um, like, hey, if somebody didn't want this house, what would they be looking for? And I would pull lists of those listings that are available on the market and include a list of those listings as well in that. A great way to get your school information, um, nearby businesses and all of that would be through list reports. So listreports.com, it's a free service that allows you to go in there, create a, a user ID and password, and um, it pulls all the nearby property information once you put in the address. It also makes open house flyers, so it's a really easy way to do that. Um, make sure you don't host your open houses by yourself. I already mentioned this, but here is that for reiteration, right? Bring a spouse, bring a vendor, bring another agent. If you bring another agent, please make sure to have a plan in advance of what the plan is with any leads that come in through that open house, okay? It can sometimes get a little funky when it comes to people's money, which is why I prefer to share the open house with lenders or insurance agents or home inspectors or pest inspectors. Um, but if push comes, and your, if your spouse or your kid's not available, then bring another agent. Just don't do it by yourself. 
Um, and you should let the people you know um, know what the address is of the open house, the hours that you will be there, the anticipation of time of when you'll be done, and a code you can use if there's trouble when you call. Okay. So, right. Hey, I'd like some peaches from the store, please. Right. That could be like your emergency code, something like that. On the day of the open house, as I already mentioned, arrive early. I usually arrive 30 minutes early. I'm gonna turn on every single light in the house, even if it's the middle of summer in the middle of the afternoon. I'm gonna make sure that the temp is appropriate. Is it too hot, too cold in the house? I'm gonna make sure I set that appropriately and make note of whatever the sellers had it set on so I can return it once I'm done. I don't want people walking in in the summer and feeling like the house is 85 because they're gonna assume the AC doesn't work or same thing in the winter. If it's too cold, they're gonna assume the heat doesn't work very well. Um, I'm going to open all those curtains and blinds. I'm going to let all the light in and turn on all those lights. <laughs> I'm also going to walk around the home and I'm going to make sure that things are placed where they should be, that there aren't bras and underwear hanging out where they don't belong and that the dirty clothes are tucked away someplace and that I put away people's uh, bath mats. I don't like people walking across people's bath mats and the bathroom looks cleaner if they're not on the floor. So sometimes I like hang those up on the edge of the bathtub or wherever that might be, but I move those. I'm gonna look for valuables and medication. Is anything sitting out in eyeshot that might cause somebody to want to accidentally pick it up and take it home with them? Let's move it, make notes of that um, so that you stash all that stuff away. And then make sure that you bring all of your open house kit with you. So you have sign-in sheets, evaluation forms, um, you know, a copy of all the stuff that's in the Google Drive. And that maybe in case it's slow, you have something that you can be working on in the meantime. So you're not just wasting your time. Um, when people show up to your open house, you want to acknowledge everybody that walks through the door, right? You want to be like the best retail person in the world. They open the door, you welcome. Oh, welcome to the open house. How are you today? I'm going to ask them to sign in. I will not allow them to walk through my open house if they do not sign in. It's a safety and security issue. I will not allow them. Okay, somebody who doesn't want to sign in isn't there to buy the house anyways or share their information to become a client of mine. So they must sign in. Um, on that sign in sheet, it is not going to have things like, are you working with an agent? Okay, I'm not going to ask that on a sign-in sheet. I only want that information if they volunteer it. Otherwise, I'm going to continue marketing them as my prospect. Um, I may not also ask, there was another question on a sign-in sheet that I looked at and said, oh, I wouldn't include that either, but I don't remember what it was. I'll look in a minute. <clears throat> I'm really, I really am looking for their name, address, phone number, email, right? Um, and my goal is to engage them with questions, right? Have you seen very many houses? Oh yeah, we've seen quite a few. Oh, great. Um, are you just hitting open houses or somebody showing you those houses? Oh, we have an agent that's showing us houses. We just happen to be driving by this one, right? Now I know, oh, they have an agent. Great. Who is your agent, right? So if they volunteer that information, I'm going to ask who their agent is because now I'm going to follow up with their agent or at least pass that information off to the agent whose listing it is so they can follow up with the agent. And then I'm going to write them off my list. Um, so I want to ask questions that's kind of a workaround to find out if they're working with an agent without working with one and also find out, oh, what did you think of this house? Um, do you like the kitchen? Do you prefer more of an open concept? Or do you like this one that has more of a family room, living room feel, right? I want to find out what they're looking for if they've been pre-approved, right? So I'm just going to engage them with questions. Um, so that I can make notes about what they're looking for. Because my goal is going to be that once we close down the open house, um, I'm going to set them up on a property search as part of my follow-up. So I want to know what they want, what areas they're looking with. I'm going to let them explore the home on their own. I'm not going to worry about following them around. Okay. My goal is to kind of man the front door. If I've got somebody else, they're kind of meandering around the main section of the house. We're both going to be interacting with all these people walking through. And um, making sure they don't walk out with things they shouldn't be, but ultimately letting them explore on their own. If somebody wants information, right? If somebody's like, man, yeah, I do like this house, but I really wanted that four bedroom home, right? This is where I'm going to exchange value for their contact information. Oh, perfect. I have your phone number as this. Can I text something to that number? Yeah. Or I, I have your email as this. Is that accurate? 
right? So now I've confirmed their information so I can share the information from that Google Drive with them. If they're like, man, I really love this house. Be like, great, I can share, I can send you a list of all the upgrades and features to the property. Would you like that? Oh yeah, perfect. Great. Now we're going to confirm their information again, right? So we're always looking for ways to share and confirm the contact information that they wrote down because unfortunately people like to lie on the sign-in sheets. Um, we're going to watch and listen, right? What do they like about the property? What is their conversation, right? Can we tell from their body language they like this house, they don't like this house? That's going to lead us to be what questions we ask them. Um, and we're going to ask questions that are going to lead to appointment opportunities. Our goal during the open house, not only is it to walk away with either one buyer or seller lead, but it's to set the next appointment. So if somebody's walking through the property and they're like, oh man, I really like what they've done with this kitchen. Oh, our kitchen is nicer than this. And we're like, oh, are you a neighbor? Do you live down the street? And they'll be like, yeah. Oh, cool. Are you guys also thinking about listing? Well, we were thinking about it, but probably not until next year. Then you can be like, great. Let's schedule a time I can come by and do a walkthrough of your property. Number one, I can see if I've got, you know, any buyers that might be interested in it that kind of have that time frame that they aren't quite ready yet either. Number two, I can give you some suggestions and ideas of things you can be doing now to prep your property for sale for next year. Does that sound good? Right. I want to get into their house. If it's somebody that I interact with and um, I find out they're renters or they're looking to buy and it doesn't sound like they have an agent or they haven't uh, you know, stated that they have an agent, then I'm going to be like, hey, um, let's sit down. Let's schedule an appointment to have time to sit down and talk about the home buying process. I'll answer any questions that you have, address any concerns, and just kind of talk about what that process looks like and help you guys move towards being ready to make that move. Does that sound good? And I'm going to set that appointment at the open house. It's going to be more likely that they're going to set an appointment and show up to the appointment if you can set it there versus being like, oh, I'll call you tomorrow and schedule that appointment. Okay. If you know what other homes are in the neighborhood and one of these doesn't match, you can be like, hey, there's actually a four bedroom home just around the corner for here. It's not open today. But, um, you know, I closed down this open house at two. Would you like to meet over there at about 2.30 and I can show you that property? Right? Set the appointment so that you have a, a plan in place to meet back up with them. Any questions about conducting the open house? If you're in the open house and somebody shows up and it makes you feel weird and something's not right, walk outside. Don't stay in there. Get on the, if you're there by yourself, which again, you shouldn't be, you know, get on the phone with somebody, whatever it might be. Um, but don't feel like you've got to stay in an uncomfortable situation. If you're feeling uncomfortable, there's probably a reason for that. All right, goal. Oh, look at, there was a whole slide for that. Your goal is to make appointments, right? Make as many appointments as you can. Schedule the show another property, set up buyer appointments, set up listing appointments, set up pre-listing appointments. Um, offer if there's a, you know, somebody that's a homeowner, offer to do a free market analysis of their home. Let them know you'll drop it off later this week or that you'll drop it off on Monday. Ask if they're going to be home, right? For rent, uh, renters or potential buyers, ask if they're interested in getting a copy of your uh, buyer system, right? Or if you have like a buyer consultation or whatnot, um, that like the home buying process, like ask them if they'd like a copy of your booklet showing them what the home buying process looks like. After the open house, your goal is to return the home as you found it. Brief the sellers if they return and keep it positive, right? Let them know how many parties pass through and what people said. If they aren't there, just write them a little thank you note. Thank you so much for allowing me to host your home open today. Make sure you collect all your signs, which is a really good idea to make sure you mark how many signs you had out and where they were to make sure you get all your signs back. I would say create a thank you video, right? Pick a key feature of the home, positive or negative, and record a video in front of that key feature. Just saying thank you so much for passing through the open house today at 123 Sample Street. If you have any questions or need anything real estate related, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm going to send that to everybody that passed through the open house. I'm also going to send out thank you notes to all of those attendees. If I have their addresses or if I have their um, email addresses, I'd prefer an address. But if I don't have an address, I would send it to an email address. You can report back to the listing agent if it's not your listing of how the open house went, how many parties came through, what the thought was. If you had anybody that had 
um, agents, you can send their agent information to the listing agents. So they can follow up with those. You're going to make sure you add any new prospects captured to your database. This is a really important step right here. Make sure you add them to your database. Otherwise, your time there is lost. Wah, wah, you're throwing money away on pieces of paper in your office that never go in your database. And then follow up, follow up, follow up. And by follow up, this is what I would recommend. I would recommend after the open house, they go on an eight by eight campaign. I am over time, so feel free to leave if you need to, but make sure you put them on an eight by eight campaign or you're gonna reach out one time per week for the next eight weeks. And I would start immediately after the open house with like the next three days, I'm gonna to touch base with them daily, trying to get them to answer my phone calls or respond. Um, the goal here is a response. And if there's no response after those first eight weeks of reaching out to them on a weekly basis, then we're going to move them to a 19 to connect. So part of that eight by eight campaign may be number one, like the thank you, right? The thank you video. I'm going to send that out and say thank you for passing through the open house. That's today's touch. Tomorrow's touch may be, uh, hey, I'm just checking in to see if you had any questions regarding that property um, that I was hosting open at 123 Sample Street or any other properties that you happened to walk through yesterday. I can help you with any of them, right? So that might be day two. And then day three, um, maybe something similar or maybe, hey, I was thinking about setting you up for a home search so that you had properties delivered to your inbox on a regular basis. Do you have anything specific that you would like as part of that home search, right? So day one, day two, day three. And now I'm gonna move to one time per week for eight weeks, which may be setting them up for that home search and then following up on it. Um, it may be a text message, a phone call, so you can decide how you want to reach out to them on a weekly basis. If no response after eight weeks, we're going to move them to that 19 to connect. I would do um, put them in my database and have alerts to set up to remind me to call them on a quarterly basis. So they get one call per quarter. They would get 12 monthly emails. They would get an invite to one of my events, and they would get two mailings per year is how that 19 to connect campaign is set up. You can change those up, but the goal is interaction to try to get them to connect with you. And then we're gonna move them to the um, 36 to convert them to clients. On the quarterly phone call, I would do the three-step quarterly phone call. I'd call them on like Monday of the week and call and leave a message if they don't answer. Something like, hey, this is Amy. I'm just calling to touch base with you. Uh, I will touch base with you later this week. The second call later this week, I'm going to call them again. If I don't get them, I'm going to shoot them over a text message. Hey, this is Amy again. Just trying to connect up with you to see if I could help you with anything. I'll try you later on this week, right? And then on Friday, I'm going to call them again. If they don't answer, I'm going to leave a message. Hey, this is Amy. I hope everything's going well. Afraid to reach you this week. I didn't get you. But if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm also going to send the same thing in a text message right? Three steps. So every time I try to call somebody, they're going to get a three-step approach. And that's the end. Oh, I've got some um, stuff to share with you. Hold on. And Abby will share this in the um, a link in the comment section of the video once it's uploaded. I have to find it. Hold on. Back here someplace. All right. There is a sample farm introduction letter that I will share with you. Hello, my name is Amy with Realty One Group. I want to take a quick moment to introduce myself, right? So for those farms, hold on, the little thing just keeps popping down and I can't see my, there is a farm. Oh, here's the farm data sheet that helps you calculate the turnover rate, average sales price. So you can keep track of your farm. Um, List reports, it's really late, so I'm not going to show you, but just remember list reports, you can create marketing kits for open houses that have the property information, community, um, nearby community resources, restaurants, schools, all that information in there that you can use to put in your Google Drive folder. This is the open house sign-in sheet that I will share with you, although again, I would make mine a little differently because this one says <clears throat> oh, no, this is the follow up for your seller so that you could give this to the listing agent or to your seller. Um, break down of today's visitors, neighbors, buyers with realtors, realtors previewing the property, buyers looking on their own, total parties and any comments. Right. Great way to do that. 
go away. There we go. Um, this is the open house sign in sheet that I will share with you. Maybe. There we go. Um, it is for feedback, name, email, phone number. How did you hear about the open house? Right. Good way to figure out what kind of marketing is working. And then rate the home of the condition, character, location, floor plan, amenities, and price. Are you working exclusively with a realtor? I would take that out. And um, I would also take out how would you like homes that meet your criteria to be emailed directly to you instead of searching for homes. I would just um, take both of those out because I'm going to send that to them whether they opt in or not. I don't want them to opt out. I only want them to answer questions that I want answers to. So, but I'll share that with you as well because you can tweak that. So just some tools in there um, that you can have for both farms and open houses. Does anybody have any questions before we wrap up today? I'm sorry we went long. No, ma'am, as usual, all great information. Fabulous. Abby would like you to um, log your attendance on the Google form that's posted in the chat box. And remember, I'll be back on here at four o'clock on the same channel, same link, um, to go over <laughs> your Barry's basics. <laughs> all right, fabulous. Uh, I will see you all later or tomorrow. Have a fabulous day. Bye, Amy. Bye. Bye. Thank you.